So the idea behind this is really to be an interactive session if possible. So if anyone has, has laptops, um, it would be great to, to, if you could install Rust. If you'd like, you can take a photo of the slide to, so you don't lose that URL. I mean, the URL has the command in there. The Computer, but WebAssembly targets any computer. 
And that's why it's ideal for targeting the browser front end. For other reasons, WebAssembly is also being used um, in cloud native environments um, on the blockchain and smart contracts and embedded systems. So let's just jump right in. Um, I'm going to do some light coding and uh, build a basic WebAssembly um, alert program. Um, it would be a website that produces a JavaScript alert, but in Rust. And you'll have an opportunity to do it yourself afterwards as well. So I'm going to uh, start by um, running the command cargo. Cargo is Rust's build tool. Um, it makes it easy to package together, run, and test Rust applications. I'm going to run cargo new, and I'm going to call my program today alert, because we're going to be producing an alert message. And cargo has created a folder for us called alert, so I'm going to enter into that alert folder. And we can see inside our alert folder, we have a file and a directory, uh, our source directory and our cargo.toml file. And inside our source directory, we have our main.rs file. I'm going to open our cargo.toml file in my editor. You can choose whatever editor you like. And we can see here that our cargo.toml file has some metadata associated with our project. So we can see here the name of our project is there. I'm going to add a dependency to our project. The dependency I'm going to add is called seed. Um, and the version I'm going to use is 0 0.10. Seed is the library we're going to be using to talk to the browser front end and to talk to WebAssembly. I'm going to now go to our main.rs file. So Cargo has automatically created for us a Hello World project, but this project is designed to be run in the console, so I'm going to delete that code. I'm going to take a, a minute here to highlight the usefulness of looking at documentation. Rather than just showing you what commands we can use, I'm going to sort of discover them live. Um, so I'm going to search here for um, uh, one sec, alert JavaScript, um, and I'm going to append the search with um, MDN because the Mozilla web docs are the best place to get JavaScript documentation. Um, I'm going to open the first link here. And we can see that on the in the JavaScript world, there is an alert method that exists on this window object in JavaScript. So jumping back to our Rust code, I'm going to run with cargo, uh, this cargo.open command. And this builds documentation for our project, um, including documentation for our dependencies. I tried to set this up so it would cache the build, but no, we're going to have to wait. Can you repeat the command? It's a cargo doc um, to build documentation, and dash dash open will look for your default browser and open it in the browser. Um, so now we can search here for alert. And we can see that uh, our dependencies has one of our dependencies has this alert with message method that's linked to the same alert message, alert method that we saw in the Mozilla web docs. And we can see it also exists on the window object. So we're going to need a window. So let's also search for window. And we can see here that there does exist a function for producing a window that's provided by C. So let's jump back into our code. 
I'm going to start by writing a new statement to bring that window function we saw earlier into scope. And then I'm going to create a let binding to get our window. And then finally, I'm going to take our window and alert the message on it and write hello world. In fact, I can simplify this code a little bit. Um, I don't have to bind window to a variable. Um, so let's just inline that call to window. So Rust doesn't ship with the ability to target WebAssembly by default. So we have to add that. We're going to use Rust's toolchain manager to do that called RustUp. So the command is RustUp target add wasm32 unknown unknown. And this wasm32 unknown unknown bit is called a target triple. Um, and the unknown unknown part of that demonstrates that we don't know what kind of machine our WebAssembly code will end up running on. And also, I'm going to install um, a tool called Trunk. Trunk is a thin wrapper around cargo that um, removes the need for some of the boilerplate to link with JavaScript and link with browser um, objects. Finally, um, I need to create a HTML file. Um, to be the basis for our project. I'm adding this ID app thing because we're going to use that later on, but we're not using that. Finally, we can run trunk serve. And trunk serve just builds our project and then for convenience sets up a, um, a static server where we can view our files from localhost. So now if we go to localhost 8080, we see hello world. So, now it's your turn to do that. I know there's not many people in the room that, that, that have laptops, um, but I put together a uh, cheat sheet, because it wouldn't be reasonable for me to expect you to have memorized everything that I just did. Um, so I'll just give a moment to the people, those who do have laptops to get started with that. Um, but I may continue a bit early uh, for the benefit of the majority without laptops. Um, so you may have to take a photo of it at some point. I'll be around to help out uh, if anyone gets stuck. Yeah. No, no, so the three entries are inside the loop. <coughs> and it loops, so you do the three things once. And zero to two oh, is a, is a, um, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, they a, it's 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 a, Adds a couple of link tags um, to the top of the HTML file that I produced. Um, um, and it links to JavaScript that then calls WebAssembly. Cool, thanks.
It's got a Thunderbolt. Mm -hmm. Best as an external GPU, so you can always upgrade them. That would be a much better idea, but this laptop was only 300 quid. Fair enough. Well, so, yeah. Yeah, cool. Cool. Yeah. yeah. If you run this, this here, yeah. source cargo in, that should give you cargo, uh, access to cargo. If not, also, do you have um, Xcode installed? Uh, I can check. I'm not sure on this one. Yeah, it's like that. Do you want that popped open? Or? Yeah, see if I remember that. How's it stuck in there? Yeah. Oh. Yes. Oh. Um, yeah. You're all good to start there. You can follow through the video. Of course, 
You ran this, right? Reassuring seeing somebody else go through forums to find pieces of code to use. That's, That's just part to the coding experience. Why don't you even try your try your MacBook when you're at 95%? Just that it wants to be all safe about it. Software engineers are pretty much uh, professional people. Yes. Jesus, <laughs> what's going on? <laughs> I think I'm going to 
Yeah. The best part is I think it still connects to my phone internet, so I haven't even tried to like get it faster yet. Well, it's already gone down by like, about 140 hours. That's not bad. Can't down the I'm trying to switch on the Yeah, that is very natural.
Well, that's the trouble, yeah, it's the best, <laughs> the best picture of the lot, unfortunately. to Rust by reading the Rust book, like maybe five years ago. That's quite a long while back. Um, and that was just out of interest to learn systems programming. Um, I couldn't learn C++. It was too hard for me. Um, and Rust was small enough and helpful enough a compiler to get me to, to learn some systems programming. And uh, I got very excited about it. I've kind of obsessed with it ever since. Thank you. Yeah, there's a lot to be said about a module in the terminal. Sorry? There's a lot to be said about just doing a module in the terminal. We're like, oh, this is a module. Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> yeah. that's popular. Well, Rust is, Rust is used for a lot of things, not just WebAssembly. Very few people use WebAssembly at all. Like, we use Rust on web servers for back end stuff. So, going on. Um, so, Seed uses a system called Model View Controller. Um, you may be familiar with Model View Controller if you've used other front end frameworks. Um, Seed's particular flavor is inspired by a language called Elm. So, the model is a representation of the state of your application, and the view looks at that model and uses it to draw um, onto your screen the, what you visually see in your application. The view then produces events, such as mouse clicks, key presses, and sends them off to um, something called the controller. And the controller uses those events to inform changes it then makes to the model. Um, and then keeps going around that way, the model then seen by the view, and the user interface that the user sees gets updated. So the view is allowed to see the state inside the model. Um, but it's not like taking responsibility for that state, it's just having a look at it. It's not able to change that state. So we can think of it as the view borrowing from the model. When the user interacts with the view, um, it produces a message, and it gives that message to the controller. The controller is then responsible for that message. It can then give it to someone else, or it can destroy it, delete it. Um, so we can think of it as the controller taking ownership of the message. And finally, the controller um, uses those events, um, and it makes changes to the model. It doesn't own the model, um, but it needs to be able to mutably reference what's going on in the model. So let's see if we can implement model view controller with C. So I'm going to go back to our main file, and I'm going to delete that line about doing the hello world message. We don't want to do that anymore. And I'm going to do something here called a blob 
Globin Court or a Globin Court, I don't know what it's called. Um, but some people consider it to be an anti pattern in Rust, but I don't care today. It just means we don't have to list out every single one of the things we're importing. C provides a function called start, which can be run at the uh, beginning of our application that ties everything together, starts this whole model view controller loop. And it takes four arguments. First one is the name of our application, and that needs to match up with what we put in our HTML file, and this is where the app's going to be attached to in our HTML. And then it takes three functions. Initialize, update, and view. Structs in Rust are the way that you associate together pieces of related data. So our model is going to be a struct, and I'm going to leave it empty for now. Because we don't have an application, we're not going to be putting anything in the state just yet. For our message, I'm going to use an enum. Enums in Rust are similar to enumerators you'd see in other languages. Um, they represent this idea of having one of the possible options. So you can be one of many messages. And I'm going to leave it empty for now because we don't have any messages. Our application is empty. So now let's write out our three functions, starting with initialize. Our initialize function takes two arguments, um, and we have to provide those arguments to comply with the contract that app start asks for. But we're going to use underscores for these arguments because we're ignoring them. We don't actually care about them. So don't worry too much about the types of these arguments. Um, we, we, we're ignoring them. And initialize is going to return our initial model. All we're going to do in initialize is return our model. Rust is a very expression oriented language, so it will automatically return the last expression in a function. So we can actually simplify this code and just write model. Now for our update function. Update is our, um, can be thought of as our controller. Update needs to take a message. Um, it needs to take our model. And an argument we're going to ignore. For our implementation of update, we're going to use something called a match. A match is a bit like a switch case you might see in other languages, but it's a little bit more powerful. Rust ensures that match statements are always exhaustive. So if you match on an enum, you have to handle every possible value of that enum. In our case, we're going to be matching on our message. And because we have no possible messages, we can leave this match statement empty. And finally, our view function. And our view is going to take our model. And it's going to return a HTML node. For the implementation of view, I'm just going to write 
to do. Um, because I can't be able to write the implementation yet. Is this natively supported? Yeah, so um, <coughs> to do returns, um, but to do just panics. So if you ever reach a to do, the program blows up. Um, and it returns the uh, never type, which can be coerced into any other type, so you can just dump it anywhere, um, anywhere you like. Um, just to get the code to type check, so you don't have to write everything. We saw three quite interesting type signatures there for our functions. Um, I wrote them out here, but I've deleted the um, arguments that we were ignoring that we don't care about this bit and using. Um, so I put our types here in green, like our model, our message, um, and I've put our, um, some modifiers, we call these types, in red. So when we just write the type on its own, like we write T, um, that represents taking ownership of that value. In Rust, every value has an owner, and there's only ever one owner, and that owner is responsible for destroying that value, and the owner is always tracked. Um, the second way we, we use the type is with an ampersand, ampersand T. And that represents a shared reference, um, or a reference, um, and it's called shared reference as well, because you can have multiple references to the same value. And Rust guarantees at compile time that a value is never moved while there is still a reference to that value. And I'm just going to, I forgot to set this up. Um, I think I might have forgotten it entirely. Ignore that one. Um, I had a prop for this, <laughs> but I forgot the prop. So I'm going to make a prop. Um, so this, this is our, our T, um, and our reference to T is my finger pointing at T. If we were to move our T while the reference is still around, we were to throw it away somewhere. Our pointer would then be pointing at thin air. Could be pointing at some memory that represents another type or some uninitialized memory somewhere. And if we were then to try to use our pointer, the computer would lose its mind. Um, so that's one of the things that these rules help avoid. The last way that we use the type is with our mutable reference, act mute t. Um, this is also known as exclusive reference, because we can only have one mutable reference to a value at a time. And when we have a mutable reference, we can't have any shared references to that value. But you can forget all of that. <laughs> so, <laughs> those rules are quite confusing, quite difficult to explain in the abstract, um, and certainly not useful to memorize as a beginner writing Rust code. As you use Rust, you'll see the error messages that you get, and they're usually quite helpful. They usually tell you, this is what you need to fix to make your code work. And by practicing and using the language, you'll develop an intuition around these rules. It's sufficient to know that they exist. You don't have to memorize exactly. You don't have to be the compiler for the compiler. Any questions? It's not even like T is the type, like, is that like the, I mean, you know, extrapolate some like time trip knowledge here, like, is that like, is like the value of the variable, or is it literally the type, like, I'm confused what that object is at that point. Yeah, so, um, T represents the type, yeah. um, but the type, it's a type of, um, the reason why I'm talking about types here and not values is because the ampersand is also part of the type. So you could have an act t, um, or, sorry, ampersand t, um, and that would be the type of your value. But there's, of course, a value behind that. Mm. Um, so you could think of um, t 
as, as an owned value being an actual instance of a type. Um, but it could be, the instance of t could be a pointer somewhere. Um, it could be an owned pointer. Um, it doesn't have to be like a concrete piece of memory. Um, but yeah, the, yeah that's, that's why I think about those types. Um, sure. I'm very much like a career switcher into a code, so I don't really have a very strong like computer science background. So you're talking a lot about kind of like pointers in memory and stuff like that. Uh, how do you kind of approach understanding Rust from that point of view that it's got like a very strong systems base? Like it's maybe a concept I've not really explored before. Like. I think that Rust is a good entry into systems programming mm. um, because if you were to use another language that doesn't have these rules, you don't develop the thinking that you need to defend against making mistakes that Rust prevents you from making. Um, so like I was demonstrating before, the, the whole idea of having a, a dangling pointer that points to nothing, you don't have to think about that in TypeScript because the memory is all managed for you. Um, and but in Rust, you do have to think about that. But you can think about it less because you know if you make a mistake, you'll get told. Mm. So you can almost just start coding the language and learn the system's concepts as you go. Exactly, yeah. Okay. Okay. So let's pass around a useful message. So what I want to do is build an application, a web application, a very, very simple one, where you have a button, the button contains a number, and when you press the button, the number goes up by one. I don't know if you use Vim, it's 
school, but uh, you'll find that uh, if you by mistake hit caps a lot, you get very confused. <laughs> This is not actually then, but it's close. Um, and we're going to use that mutable reference to our model to edit our model. So we go model.counter and we're going to increment it by one. Finally, we're going to do the code in our view function. To do this, we're going to use uh, some macros to do some HTML in Rust. Um, so this will look a little bit strange. So we're going to make a div tag. It's going to say this is a counter. It's going to contain a button. It's going to display our counter through our shared reference. And I'm going to attach to it a event listener with a callback. If you're familiar with callbacks from other languages, this might make a bit of sense. If not, this bit is going to not make much sense. So this is saying if you get a click on the button, send the controller an increment message. So now, if the demo dogs are with me, uh, they should compile. And we have a counter, and when we press the button, the number goes up. Any questions from that? That's just like something or a name you've given that message or something. Yes, so yeah. yeah, so I've called yeah. the message increment. Okay. It's just how you define the email. Yeah, so I could have yeah. I could put I could put here decrement. Mm. Um, and, and have two have messages. Have then okay. I have to handle it here. Mm -hmm. um, Messages like at that compile time, would it have given you that error, or if you've not handled every known case? Yes. Yeah. So if I if I um, I add another message here, and then try to compile it, it'll say that um, you need to add a match on this variant. So now this would be your turn to do it, but we are running out of time. So if you'd like to have a go at it, um, I suggest you take a photo of this slide. Um, it'd be cool to see some creativity. I saw that everyone wrote hello world on their alert. Maybe make the button decrement. Um, maybe have two buttons, that increment or decrement. Um, yeah. You should go and get out of the shop. Yes. And then it's, it's a nice place to start. You should go there and see the um, ways to trade. <coughs> you can have a walk around here. I think it's a good okay. first entry point. Yeah, you can build, build a corner, build a lot of fun, fun things on top, top of this. Especially if you've got some JavaScript knowledge. And sounds the web APIs. So, to wrap up, um, Lewis and I have been talking about 
putting together an online community. Um, so we put together a Discord server. Um, everyone's welcome to join. Um, and if you want Rust help, I'll be I'll be there. Um, and there's also the uh, what's it called again? Chalk Connect. Yeah, so we have this Chalk Connect thing being planned. I only heard about today. Um, Hot off the press, isn't it? Uh, first, is it first Thursday of every month. No, first Thursday of every month, five till seven at Foundry in Eastbourne. Yeah, so we get together to talk about code, do some coding together, um, all things technical, uh, software related. Um, so yeah, well. Probably chat about that on this Discord server as well. If you want to develop your Rust knowledge further, these are um, some books that are particularly helpful. Uh, the Rust programming language is the one that I use to learn Rust. It's been updated since, it's not massively updated. Um, and it's free online. Um, and the other books there are also, I've heard great things about them, I've read. Um, one of them. Uh, if you're particularly interested in uh, using Rust for production web applications, Zero to Production and Rust is your book. Uh, it's fantastic. Thank you. That's all from me.